Hello and welcome to The Shakedown. Our mission is to inform people about how the criminal justice system works, the real people impacted by the justice system, and methods to improve justice through compassionate and casual conversation. Hosts of The Shakedown share over 50 years of combined personal experience dealing with Texas prisons and working to change the criminal justice system. And now, here's our show. It is basically, I mean, uh, an attorney, a district attorney is basically measured on how hard can they punish someone. And even judges run on how many convictions did they get, how how harsh were they were on these type of offenders versus other type of offenders. And um, because that's the measurement that they have, there's not really another measurement for, oh, we were able to, like, these victims were like help more in this county than other counties like we can't that's there's no they we don't, we don't have that metric of how how much we help the victim i, I mean that's uh i i didn't know that uh so you're saying the jo- uh, the judges and lawyers maybe I, I had some idea with lawyers they're they're measured and their professional their professional um advancement is based on how much how harsh they are so like when if you look at like campaign ads for mm-hmm. judges or district attorneys and they're not all these are not always elected roles mm-hmm. and um but when you look at a, a campaign ads their campaign ads are based on um like I was just watching one for a judge today and it what her campaign ad explicitly says um there was a child um this man killed a child and she killed him right back and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So like they, they advertise that and then they'll put other ones where this district attorney, you know, reelect district attorney, such and such, because mm-hmm. you, he was the harshest one on drunk drivers da, 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 da. Mm-hmm. and going, going on that. Um, and they'll, they'll do it that way and they'll, they can go and point to their record. Um, yeah. and, and same way, even just within the district attorney's office, they, there's no, like, you can't. It's a just like a a good defense attorney, mm-hmm. a good att- defense. You know, a defense attorney is good if they can get you um, your charges dropped or your charges lowered. That tells you how, and how often they're able to do that. That tells mm-hmm. you how good the defense attorney is, and then they charge more <laughs> ultimately. Mm-hmm. And then, but if for a district attorney, their metric is going to be how. Um, how often they prevent that from happening because ultimately that's the only thing they're offering because they're not offering anything else. Whereas if there was, if this was a restorative justice model, they would be offering anything they could be offering. Um, if, um, if the, the victim wanted to just, you know, They wanted to pay for the funeral costs for, you know, someone they killed or they wanted to or someone or the hospital costs or they wanted to actually, you know, work closely with the victims or make um, the I mean, honestly, I'm having trouble coming up with it because Mm -hmm. it's there. It's the possibilities are endless because it's really it's it's individual. It's dependent on what the victims want if they even Mm -hmm. want to they don't even have to talk to the to the person who did it in a restorative situation Mm -hmm. uh it's dependent on the individual case Mm -hmm. and then um it's dependent on and it's also dependent on if the person like you said if they're remorseful or not or even willing to work in that if they're not admitting any guilt at all then they can't even enter into it or make like a good then then really the only thing is left is to go into court and fight it out to see if there is evidence that this person did it or not and that that's it the other thing that district attorneys have a lot of people overlook is that district attorneys a lot of people think that the judge is in charge of the sentence but really it's the district attorney because 90 to 95 percent of cases don't 
ever even go to court, they get settled in pleas. Mm -hmm. And the plea is determined by the district attorney and Mm -hmm. signed by the defendant. Mm -hmm. And a plea that's that the district attorney wrote that the defendant signed is not going to be argued by a judge. Mm -hmm. And um, the judge has to finally agree with it, but they're never going to argue with it. And the reason that the district attorney can do that is because, so my case was I was facing 40 years. Mm -hmm. And if I had gone up for, uh, if I had tried to plea it out and Mm -hmm. said, I want to get a good plea, this attorney could have said, all right, we'll give you five. If you Mm -hmm. take, say guilty and sign this paperwork and then you make sure we don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. Um, If you like, you know, and that's like a, or you can fight it and we're going to push for all 40 right right there. And so that's, I mean, and a lot of people, they didn't even like, they know they didn't do it, Mm -hmm. but that's a big risk. That's a huge gamble. They're going to take between difference between five and 40. And like, in my case, I have to serve half of that period. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And I ended up getting, I got the, um, I ended up having to do 10 mm-hmm. with it going to court because they weren't going to offer me a plea mm-hmm. because I didn't know what I know now, which is if you just tell them you're guilty in the beginning, they're not going to yeah. give you a plea. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yep. I, I fought a traffic ticket and learned the same thing with, you know, less consequences, but. Yeah, it's uh, it actually pays not to fight that much unless you have an extremely strong case, especially if there's a jury. Yeah. Anyway, you yeah, you just I mean, you wait for a plea, but like you don't you just you don't say. You have to say not guilty to start Mm -hmm. with, and then Mm -hmm. no matter what the situation is, and then Mm -hmm. wait for them to come back. But um, yeah, that's that's kind of my point. Then point is, is that. There's no, there's no measuring stick for a Mm -hmm. district attorney other than how harsh they are on certain sentences. In certain counties, they have different, um, the the makeup of the county is different. Some of them care more about like um, their camera war fentanyl. They care more Mm -hmm. about certain types of drugs. Some Mm -hmm. of them care more about drinking. Some of Mm -hmm. them care more about, I don't know, littering, or they care Mm -hmm. more about, there's certain offenses that are like, big deals in each county and i'm not even talking cities just counties and um it it's very dependent so when they're either getting appointed or elected or however they're going for the job if they can really hit that like hit that area hard Mm -hmm. and show that they're doing really well on this this certain um certain area on this certain crime then they will, that will keep them moving forward. And especially, right. and, yeah. yeah. And, and if they work like well with the police. Social, political issues and agendas and all that sort of thing. I mean, it, to me, it speaks to some collective mental health issue around punitive approaches. Mm-hmm. So again, uh, I don't want to come off like I'm not for consequences. I, I believe the the best philosophy is personal accountability and um, that can be really difficult um, a lot of the time, but I believe in justice too. So like there needs to be some level of this is a fair consequence. Um, This idea of just like hurt people more and like in your circumstance, like give him 40 years. How is that helping anything? You're not going to come out better. You're not going to come out resolved. You're not going to come out healed. The system can cause incredible trauma. And quite frankly, it does cause incredible trauma. Institutions can cause and do cause incredible trauma. I know I know a guy who um, murdered his bunkie when he was 19 um, and uh, ended up adding another 20 years to his sentence. And um, at 42 years old, he was told that he would be released. I don't know how they came to that conclusion, 
but he was terrified of getting released. I, you know, he started talking to me about it and we were trying to prep for how he was going to be successful. And I started asking him about like Uber or something like that. Like, do you know how to take an Uber and whatever? And he goes, bro, I never been on the internet before. And, uh, he, he was really scared to get out because he felt so ill-equipped to function on the outside world. He had been in since, I think he said he was like in juvie since he was 10 or 12 or something like that because he had a horrible upbringing and been in prison his entire life. He had no socialization. And I think, I think his peers were so excited for him to get out and it was such a great opportunity that he decided to go, but he was freaked freaked the hell out to get out and i think very ill-equipped um once he once he got out i no uh one of the co-hosts on this show is he was he spent 30 years in prison and he was in the same boat you never um he hadn't done anything he had used ended up using the internet from inside but Mm -hmm. that's but like um but like he yeah, um, it's tough. It's a tough, scary transition. Me, that's when you're locked up. You're the a lot of these, a lot of these people. They they have like careers in sex trafficking, in drug dealing, in armed robbery. Um, these are their careers because mm-hmm. they don't have under other skills. These are the skills <laughs> they know. These are the ones they have. Yeah. Um. This the skills you could get while you were locked up were GED mm-hmm. and maybe a trade if you were lucky. Right, and right. now that's about it. College may if you were down for a really long time, you would get some college. And I, I will tell you, um, I took correspondence course because my family helped pay for it, and I like. I watched the people who actually went to the college at the prison, the one prison in Texas that has college courses. Mm-hmm. Oh man. Um, they had to fight to get to class. It was like the the guards did not let them go. They did not want them to go. It was a mess. Mm-hmm. And they had to write, um, they had to write up the guards and everything that didn't let them go and then they'd have to worry about the guards retaliating later on and they'd have to it was an entire stressful mess just to try and get a degree but like yeah there's nothing they're not um as far as like just offering skills to like go out and live with there's not they're not getting that and it really it really bothers me (laughs) yeah i mean so one thing I'd say to anybody in the public that is maybe, you know, learning something by our conversation here is that, you know, this incentive and pressure that judges and prosecutors have on them to, you know, reduce drunk driving accidents, reduce drug offenses, to reduce sex crimes, gang activity, whatever it may be, the result isn't to get more. The best result, in my opinion, is not, not to get more convictions. It's to treat offenders better so that they're restored back into the community and our communities become healthier. Well, one thing that everyone forgets in the the whole equation, eventually 99.9% of people who are locked up will get out. Yeah. They're coming back out. Right. And if they, if on the majority of them when they come out of prison they are worse than when they went in right so that is the should be the biggest incentive of all right is if they don't like we need to help these guys if we're gonna lock them up we need to do something like we need to be taking care of them while they're locked up and on top of and that's on top of the fact that it's costly it's expensive it's yep. inhumane it's yep. like there's a lot of things you could add on top of that, but it's mm-hmm. like you, the sky's coming back. He might come back to your neighborhood. Then what? Right. Yeah. So repeat, repeat crime. I think I've read recidivisms in the 80 percentile. So right. 
if one person goes to jail, they're 80 something percent likely to go back. Something's not right there. That's way too high. What are we doing about it? Uh, exactly. And it's, there are things, um, well, there, there's lots of things that help, um, that help them. If you having connections to your family, having a, having work, paying work outside of prison mm -hmm. helps a lot. Um, and being well educated, those are three things, but they are, um, right now, one of the biggest things, like I said, having support have, and which is not, um, having a, uh, a conditional loan that they have to repay back. Okay. Um, no, yeah, there's that. Um, but not having a conditional loan to pay back. It's a, it's having something actually having support, having mentors that can help them, um, can help them grow, um, mm -hmm. loving family support. And one of the biggest things that prisons have been doing all across the country and, um, shout out to Malone who loves it when I bring up this topic. Um, they're like making it more difficult to contact them when in, they're in prison, limiting mail, limiting cards, limiting phone calls, limiting all of those things. Limit, oh, visitation, um, having dogs search people, all these kind of things. Like it is, uh, they, they are making it, we're, it's actively being made harder than probably even when you were up at Canyon City. So it is, um, yeah, <laughs> this is, there, there are things that we know that work. That's actually those three things, the social support, education, and employment are actually on the Department of Justice's website as things that are proven to help. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and for those that don't have that, those things, um, there also needs to be something that like needs to be applied. There's something that has to be done for those people as well, you know? Um, and it's an unfortunate thing. I mean, I'm not super religious, but there is a biblical saying that has always stuck with me, which I think, I think Jesus said something like, uh, um, the poor will always be with us. And you know, whether you're Christian or not, that doesn't matter. Like the wisdom that's trying to be con conveyed is the poor are always going to be with us. Like, I don't think there is some utopia where people are going to come out, uh, where, where we're going to have civilization mastered to the degree, to the degree where there's no trauma and there's no hardship and there's economic balance all the time. I don't, I don't think, I don't think that can happen. I would love to see that, but I don't think we're close. And so there's going to be disadvantaged people no matter what, and we need to keep working with them and we need to try keep trying to rehabilitate, rehabilitate them until we get this right. I mean, a hundred years ago, uh, uh, famine was a really big issue and like widespread disease was a really big issue. And now not so much, you know, now even like the poorest people can get free clothes and, and a meal at the, at the shelter. That's a big improvement in humanity. I hope we have more to go. Uh, and in the meantime, you know, we need to, we need to deal with disadvantaged people, people who aren't educated, um, people who uh, can't get a job um can't hold a job people who have serious severe mental health issues we still need to try to work with them that's absolutely did um on that were there any problems that you found were especially prevalent uh amongst the people you were working with i mean we were really trying to to change prison culture so prison culture, I'm sure, as is, is you have some experience with, um, it's, it sucks. There, there's, uh, like you're saying, transactional relationships or no relationships, a lot of posturing, a lot of fear. Um, the, the food's terrible. I don't know what's, what's to be done about the food. But, um, <laughs> but uh, we, were, we were really trying to like, aim at reducing conflict. So if... If I can use my words to speak with you instead of my fists, win, right? Um, safer for inmates, safer for correctional officers. Um, if we can learn better communication skills, um, if we can slow down, if we can um, try to find some empathy, if we can apply some certain things, um, 
uh, it's, it's probably going to be a better environment. So uh, we were really aimed at reducing physical violence. Yeah, I mean, is so, yeah, and I, I can see that with the way that you were talking about with uh, the act of listening, the discussing it, actually just getting people to listen to one another as opposed to reacting and acting, mm -hmm. acting out yeah. when that happens. Just realizing there's another there's another way. And like like I was just saying a few minutes ago, most guys that we worked with and, and ladies that we work with, they don't have any education. They grew up in really ignorant communities, ignorant families, um, toxic situations, right? Like gang culture. Most people that get attracted to gangs in my uh, experience from what I've heard is um, horrible mom and dad, blood family origin. So need some connection, need some group gang is willing to give some love, even if it's intertwined with violence and drugs. So now I have my gang. So I have my replacement family. Right. Gang members generally don't have a great family and a loving mother and father. Right. Right. <laughs> it's usually quite the opposite that they get attracted to a gang. So um, situations like that, like they've just never been taught like uh, empathy, communication, psychological skills, communication skills, um, and so exposing exposing that population just to just some really basic stuff, um, I think makes a difference. That's one, and I noticed that too. I learned when I once I learned how gangs actually work, mm -hmm. how there's the, the the initiation process, which is incredibly mm -hmm. violent and everything. And yeah. also, the gang's love is conditional. It is you have love, you have support, you have protection. It's very conditional on right. whether you are supporting the gang and whether the, the how they're what is their opinion of you mm -hmm. it's not family and none of them have, have maybe even had a relationship where they've had unconditional love and support from someone mm -hmm. and the idea of it so i've seen guys who've like come into contact with the concept mm -hmm. and they either immediately blow it off and they're like that's that's not even possible or yeah. they just break down when they see it and they're like, and they have like a religious experience You're right, right. seeing it. Right. Yeah. But, um, so in your, before we, before we wrap up, I'd like to know, um, what do you think could be improved or any other final thoughts you'd have, to, um, like to add before we wrap up with the justice system with y yes. incarcerated populations or with therapy in there as well. I mean, I'd love to see more programs from the outside coming and trying to make an impact. Um, I'd love to see more funding for those kinds of programs from the public. Um, I, I think one thing that is encouraging um, is, and I've heard police officers talk about this, I've heard correctional officers talk about this at multiple facilities, is that um, as much as it might be annoying to that population of, of correctional officers, uh, the 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 consequences of the George Floyd situation um, really changed a lot of things inside the institutions. There are cameras on every corners. There's body cams on every um, correctional officer. So there's no more he said, she said. There's no more power abuse. Um, there's so much more accountability. And there's actually really tight, I think, well um, uh, formulated um, justifications for applications of violence. So like if you start yelling at me and I'm a cop and you're being aggressive, but you're just yelling at me, I can't shoot you. If you're running at me with a knife, maybe it's justified that I shoot you. But if you're just yelling at me, I'm not allowed to say, Hey, I'm scared. So I shot him and killed him. Right. It needs to be appropriate escalations of control and that sort of thing of of like appropriate meeting of the injustice uh, is starting to spread like wildfire throughout the system and i think it, it's really encouraging for changing some of the culture i was um i had to do a defense tactic class and i was talking with a guy who had been uh in the correctional field for 30 years and he was he was talking about what I'm talking about now with with the changes that are happening with correctional officers. And he was saying 20 years ago, the uh, the 
culture was if your you know person that you're trying to control your your inmate your prisoner was talking out of order you smack them over the head with a club and tell them to shut the f up okay that doesn't fly anymore they have they're they're instructed to do a completely different thing because the public is paying attention and i think that sort of change in the system is a really good thing and i think it will continue to be so and i think the the, the system has a lot of chance of of improving because there's a lot more eyes on it i i hope so i hope that's yeah. uh, that is big hope and i honestly and i think that's honestly the biggest lesson is um daylight is the best medicine <laughs> it's mm -hmm. it helps it bringing attention to it having people um see it and that's also why we have a podcast so we can talk about it more get more mm -hmm. people to see it and speaking of which um how how can they find you? Where, what are you doing now? What are you up to now? Sure. Yeah. So, um, I have a private practice right now. I'll be, um, offering a lot more in-person programs, a lot like what I was offering in the prisons, um, next year. But if you're an individual that's looking for counseling, um, uh, my website is betterrelationships.work. Uh, I also work with couples, uh, really specialize in couples work and trying to resolve conflicts. If there's infidelity, um, long-term connection issues, um, really good at kind of like helping reestablish love and trust for couples. Um, yeah. And then of course, you know, I've, I've done general mental health for, uh, 15 years now. So any real clinical issues, just really trying to find yourself, trying to find meeting, trying to improve your life with anxiety or, or depression or whatever. Um, I do free consultations. Um, you can look me up, Max Brandel, just Google me and, um, see if we're a good fit. Cool. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's been a pleasure. You can find Shakedown merch, graphic novels, and other projects at waywardpress.com. That's W-A-Y-W-O-R-D press.com. If you would like to support The Shakedown, get exclusive content, and watch episodes live, you can support us at patreon.com slash the shakedown like subscribe and leave a comment to give malone that inner peace he so richly deserves <laughs>